Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Bariatric Happy Hour. Um, it sounds like everybody is starting to join, um, so I will give you a few minutes to all hop in here. Um, thank you so much for coming tonight. We're really excited. Um, it's going to be a fun hour. Um, <clears throat> and um, before we get started with the program, I just wanted to make a few announcements. Um, just wanted to remind everybody um, that the this journal club is put on by the Bariatric Surgery Training Committee, which is one of the ASMBS committees. And we also produce the Fellow Project, which is a monthly um, session on the first Friday of each month at 7 a.m. Eastern or 12 p.m. Pacific time. And it is organized to um, fulfill the didactic requirements for ASMBS certification. Um, it's totally free. Um, it's very informative. So if you have not uh, visited that and checked it out, um, I would highly encourage you. And then I just wanted to say, don't forget to register for ASMBS weekend, which is in San Antonio, Texas, on November 10th to 12th. And they are also hosting the second annual ASMBS Leadership Academy, um, which is a really awesome program for fellows. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just share a few slides here. Um, if I can figure out how to work the computer. Um, all right. So thank you all and welcome to our bariatric happy hour. Um, so this is a monthly session that is going to be a back and forth journal club and video sessions um, on the uh, third or fourth Thursday of the month, um, unless it's a holiday. And this is going to be a journal club. So we, the topic of the evening is uh, marijuana use um, in the setting of bariatric surgery. And the article we chose is called marijuana use does not affect weight loss or complication rate after bariatric surgery. And this was just published this year. Um, <clears throat> The uh, fellow who's going to be providing the paper presentation is uh, Dr. Brandon Smith, um, and he is the Minimally Invasive and Bariatric Surgery Fellow from Gunderson Health System um, in La Crosse, Wisconsin, which Wisconsin is my residency alma mater. Um, and he earned his medical degree from Northeast Ohio Medical University in 2017 while also earning a graduate certificate in medical ethics. He completed his general surgery residency in 2022 at Cinema Health in Akron, Ohio. And he has a particular clinical interest in the surgical management of obesity and metabolic disorders. Um, the uh, uh, faculty discussant and the senior author on the paper is Dr. Farah Hussein. Um, and she is uh, the Ira Fulton Endowed Chair of Bariatric and Metabolic Surgery at the University of Arizona um, College of Medicine in Phoenix. Um, she earned her medical degree at George Washington University and completed her internship and residency in general surgery at the Madigan Army Medical Center in Fort Lewis, Washington. Um, she did her MIS fellowship at Emory University in Atlanta. Uh, she worked as an active duty general surgeon and was deployed overseas twice and then moved to Denver, Colorado, where she started her own medical surgical weight management program. In 2015, she was recruited to OHSU in Portland, Oregon, um, where I got to work with her as a fellow, um, which was wonderful. And eventually she uh, became the division chief of bariatrics there, as well as the program director um, for the MIS fellowship. Um, she is on the executive council of ASMBS. Um, she was the president of the Oregon state chapter. Um, she um, was the inaugural chair of the uh, committee on diversity and inclusion. Um, she serves on the board of the ASMBS foundation and is the current co-chair of the SAGES metabolic and bariatric surgery committee. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn everything over to Dr. Smith. Um, and I am really looking forward to this presentation. Thank you all so much. 
All right, um, I'm going to share my screen here. Bear with me um, as I figure out how to do this for sure. All right, um, can you guys see the uh, the slides? That's great. Yes, we can. Perfect. All right, great, awesome. Um, so yeah, thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, very uh, much appreciate it. Um, so tonight uh, for Bariatric Happy Hour, our journal club, the article is marijuana use does not affect weight loss or complication rates after bariatric surgery. This article was published in Surgical Endoscopy in 2022. I'm gonna make a quick plug for uh, Dr. Walter Pori's. Um, I love his comics. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, he's a bariatric surgeon um, and he's very into comics and does some really interesting things for uh, clinical medicine. Um, and I learned a little bit about this, uh, the topic of marijuana use in bariatric surgery. Um, and science is always full of surprises. So there's your Dr. Walter Pori's um, comic for the evening. Let's see if I can move this forward. I have no relevant disclosures. And here's the uh, slides for the article. Um, the authors for this article are Dr. Warrist, Dr. Malibrian, Dr. Welshhands, Dr. Dewey, and Dr. Hussein, who's with us tonight. This was published out of the uh, Division of Bariatric Surgery at Oregon Health and Science University, again in 2022, surgical endoscopy. So what do we know? Marijuana use is certainly increasing. 19 states have legalized recreational use of marijuana. The first was Colorado in 2012. 37 states allow some form of medical cannabis use. THC, which is short for tetrahydrocannabinol, and CBD, short for cannabidiol, are the two most abundant bioactive chemicals in cannabis. These chemicals act upon the body's cannabinoid system, causing several known effects. THC modulates pain and inflammation. It's also an appetite stimulant and has some anti-emetic properties. CBD, on the other hand, <clears throat> is less studied. However, rodent models have demonstrated an increase in metabolism, a decrease in appetite, and induction of weight loss when high doses of CBD. Marijuana use is a contraindication to bariatric surgery at some, some centers across the country. The authors of this article have pointed out that there's a concern for long-term cardiovascular risk, as well as an association with other substance use disorders, namely opioid use disorder. And there's a concern that the appetite stimulation effects of THC undermine the metabolic effects of bariatric surgery. There is a limited uh, literature available. However, what is published does not seem to demonstrate any increased rate of complications or changes in weight loss for patients who use marijuana and undergo bariatric surgery. The long-term data on this topic is lacking. So this begs the question, should patients who use marijuana be considered candidates for bariatric surgery? The authors seek to answer this question through their stated objective of examining the effects of self-reported marijuana use on weight loss outcomes and complication rates after bariatric surgery. So this, uh, this article was a single center retrospective cohort study they included all primary ruin y gastric bypass or sleeve gastrectomy patients who were 18 years or older. Revisional and conversion surgeries were excluded from the study. The study period began in July of 2015, which is when legalization of marijuana occurred in Oregon and ran five years through July of 2020. Per the report, all stand all patients at their bariatric center underwent a standard healthcare questionnaire. Part of this questionnaire asked patients to self-identify as marijuana users, and their options were never were they could identify as a never user, a previous user, or an active user of marijuana. Post-operative complications were tracked according to MBSA QIP data, and patient data was extracted from institutional records. A statistical analysis with a p-value set at less than 0.05 was selected and performed. So what did they find? Here's table one, which is the demographics and clinical characteristics of their patients. 
They had 1,158 patients in the study. The breakdown from based on marijuana use included 849 patients who never used, 84 patients who were current users, and 225 who identified as prior users. Those with marijuana use did have a slightly higher maximum weight, and those patients without marijuana use had a slightly higher tobacco use prevalence. Otherwise, there is no statistically significant differences between groups. Here's the continuation of table one, and this highlights several obesity-related comorbidities. As you can see, there's no statistically significant difference between groups uh, based on marijuana use and their associated obesity-related comorbidity. This is figure two from the author's study. This breaks down uh, the rate of marijuana use and how patients self-identify based on the year. It's interesting, in 2015, when the study started, 21% of patients self-identified as either current or prior marijuana users. And in the later years of the study, that rose to 33%. The authors are not quite sure why this is seen. However, you could postulate that marijuana use increased over time or that the stigma of marijuana use decreased as time and patients felt more comfortable self-reporting as users. Here's table two, and this is the first question that the authors wanted to answer, which is how marijuana use relates to weight loss after bariatric surgery. This is a multivariate regression of weight loss surgery, uh, sorry, of weight loss after surgery. You can see that weight loss was higher for younger patients, patients who underwent gastric bypass, patients who weighed more at the time of surgery, and the further out from surgery one was when their weight was taken. Importantly, patient sex and marijuana use status did not demonstrate a statistical impact on weight loss. Here's figure one from the report, and this also uh, highlights that fact. As you can see, the percent weight loss is tracked on the y-axis and the time from bariatric surgery on the x. There's no statistically significant difference in overall weight loss based on marijuana use and the p-value for this was reported as 0.23. The next thing the authors wanted to look at was complication rates of bariatric surgery and associated with marijuana use. So here's table three. This is a summary of their 30-day post-operative complication findings. There was one 30-day mortality in the study, and this was in a bypass patient in the never-used marijuana group. There is no differences in overall complication rates based on marijuana use for sleeve or for bypass. In terms of specific complications, marijuana users who underwent sleeve gastrectomy did have more outpatient IV re infusion requirements, slightly more reoperations, and a slightly higher 30-day hospital readmission rate. The authors postulate that marijuana use may increase pain and anxiety, as other studies have demonstrated an association between marijuana use and post-operative pain, opioid demand, nausea, and vomiting. And this could account for these patients needing to come back in for IV treatments as an outpatient. It is worth pointing out that although statistically significant, both the 30-day readmissions and the 30-day reoperation rates were quite low, so the clinical significance of any increased risk may be negligible. There were several limitations to the study, and several of these aren't actually limitations, but more questions for further research in the future. First, the marijuana use was self-reported, so that always begs the question of patient honesty. Um, the authors were unable to quantify the amount of marijuana or the route of use. Um, and that leads one to wonder if that does have any impact or make any difference. The reason for patient marijuana use was not assessed. Were patients using it recreationally, medicinally, or as a coping mechanism for personal trauma or life difficulties? Furthermore, the timing of the marijuana use was not necessarily assessed. All of these patients were asked their marijuana use status at entry into the bariatric program. However, as a lot of bariatric programs do focus on lifestyle changes, there may have been patients that quit marijuana use during the program and weren't active users at the time of their surgery. 
Nevertheless, they were assessed as an active user at time of surgery. Furthermore, some co-founding vari confounding variables may be present where other substances used at the time of marijuana use. And is this study adequately powered to detect complications? Because bariatric surgery is a very safe surgery and complications are very uncommon at baseline. And with so few complications reported in this study, we're not sure if marijuana use actually does have a complication association. So in conclusion, this is a single center retrospective cohort study, and this is the largest published study of marijuana use in bariatric surgery to date. The authors found that marijuana use does not significantly impact postoperative weight loss after bariatric surgery, and that marijuana use does not significantly impact the 30-day safety profile of bariatric surgery. I think that this article serves as a great springboard uh, for further research into this topic because there's a clear paucity of literature surrounding this topic. Some further uh, questions to look into in the future is, does marijuana use impact the, relate, the rate of obesity-related comorbidity resolution? And what is the long-term impact of ongoing marijuana use after bariatric surgery? And does this lead to weight regain? These are some topics that need further explored. How will this article impact my practice? Um, based on this, I would not consider marijuana use as an automatic contraindication to bariatric surgery. However, I would like to see more data before making a definitive recommendation on my practice. Thank you. And here's a picture of me and my son and my two dogs and my wife. Awesome, Brandon, that was really great. Um, thank you so much. I would love to uh, turn it over to Dr. Hussein and see um, what thoughts, questions, you know, important uh, details about this paper um, that she had, uh, and then we can open up for a general discussion after. Sounds Wonderful. great. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Brandon, for that great review. And naturally, I'm disappointed there were so many uh, weaknesses of the study, but that is the nature of science, I think. <laughs> um, but I think you keyed in on one of the things and one of the reasons we did this, honestly, is because it's so hard when we're looking at certain types of lifestyle modification, trying to decide which ones are going to be the most important uh, in affecting safety and our outcomes. And because our outcomes are so good, I think as bariatric surgeons, we're especially hypervigilant about trying to see if anything increases our risk in surgery and increases our perioperative complications. So that was really my driving force initially is when I trained and got out of training, I was actually being instructed quite often that if anyone uses marijuana, they should absolutely not have surgery. Uh, and I heard that from a lot of people. And so I thought that was naturally a given. And I came from military training. So it was also something we could, wasn't allowed in our training uh, in our life, basically. And then I took my first job in Colorado and they had just legalized marijuana use. And I found myself in a bit of a quagmire saying, well, now my patients are telling me it's legal. And so, and they can go to this dispensary down the street. So they no longer need a medical reason to use marijuana. So should I still be telling them they absolutely cannot have surgery because of this? And I honestly had no idea. And like you said, the literature in anesthesia was very compelling about why smoking marijuana was bad. And there was some literature in cardiovascular um, journals about the effect on your cardiovascular system, but almost nothing in surgery per se. And that made me do that. My first look was in Colorado and it was a similar retrospective review um, of patients we collected prospectively and looked at the same type of outcome. And with our smaller study, we found the same thing that there was no change. And we just were looking at 30 and 60 day outcomes. So we really were looking at, hey, are they gonna have more leaks? Are they gonna have more bleeds? Are they gonna come back to the hospital more? Because if yes, then that's kind of a showstopper for most of us uh, saying, no, we can't really accept that as a variable. And so in our early post-op follow-up, we didn't find any of those things. And I was actually quite surprised. We, we didn't see any increase in perioperative complications in that study. And so then I started researching more and reading about the cannabinoid receptors. Where are they? What do they do? And I found myself in this interesting hole of there might actually be some benefits to some of this. And there are also some drawbacks. So how do I decide now on the next level what to do? And that led us to looking at an even bigger population and trying to really follow them out further because 
we knew that the THC component stimulates appetite. We knew that THC may cause some other issues, uh, and it's the one that gives people that, that feeling of the high, but the CBD side actually might be a very potent anti-inflammatory. And what role does that play? And we still don't know that, but it's just in learning more about the science of the endocannabinoid system, we knew it was a lot more complex. So we thought, well, let's start as simple as we can and just look longer term first and see, are they falling off the weight loss curve? Are they having weight recurrence much earlier than their compatriots who were not using marijuana at any time? And are there any other issues? And I think the thing we found is they may need more early IV fluids. They may have a little more of that cannabin, cannab, uh, cannabis hyperemesis, not necessarily hyperemesis, but a little more tendency towards nausea. And I think something you hit on, which is something that we have not figured out exactly how to quantify is, are people using it more to deal with some of the mental health challenges and behavioral health challenges that they have? And if we have a healthcare system that perpetually under treats or under uh, does not provide access, I should say, from mental health care, not just for our patients, but any patients, if we take away the tool that they do have to allow them to survive, <laughs> then what are we doing? And so I find it to be not just a medical dilemma, I found it to be kind of a perpetual ethical dilemma because I'm not sure what the answers are to those. And so I'm hoping y'all that are much smarter than me can find those answers. <laughs> Absolutely. There are, it's funny in research, like you, you do a study and you get really excited and then you realize that there are literally a thousand other studies that could be done. <laughs> uh, it's exciting, but also a little daunting. I, I, I had one question. question. I had one question, uh, Dr. Hussein, about um, the, you know, I think in general, in part because of your publications, um, I think people have gotten a lot more comfortable doing bariatric surgery on patients uh, who use marijuana, um, especially as it's become more common with medical use and legalization around the country. Um, but the one, like the one caveat to that is hyperemesis which is a syndrome you can get with high volume kind of um, marijuana use, and it causes this really persistent nausea and vomiting syndrome that is really hard to treat. And, you know, I've come across several patients who have these symptoms, um, not in a bariatric setting, but just in a foregut setting. And, you know, when we ask, when we tell them like, Hey, marijuana can cause hyperemesis, you should really stop. They're like, what are you talking about? No, it doesn't. I'm not stopping. You know, you're crazy. Um, but the thought of doing, you know, a sleeve or a bypass on somebody and then having them have those symptoms with the compounding marijuana use, I guess my question is, have you seen that a lot? How much does that concern you? And do you think that that contributed to the rate of IV fluid use in your paper here? Yeah, I mean, I have been very lucky in that I haven't seen much hyperemesis per se, which is really that intractable vomiting that they definitely can get. And again, it is, does seem to be dose, dose correlated. So the higher use that people are using, the more you're going to see it. Um, perhaps because we are in legalized states to some extent, uh, I don't know if people are just more measured. A lot of my patients will use, you know, one gummy at night to sleep or, um, I'm not sure why I have not seen a lot of hyperemesis, but I have I've seen some people that had some nausea for sure. That was that those folks, I'm sorry, my kids just walked in. So if you hear crazy noises, it's my equivalent of the dog. Yeah, I also um, have and, dogs. <laughs> in case so, anybody's wondering why they're sparking, uh, sorry. <laughs> but we do work on, you know, if they're using a large amount, trying to, to then quantify, is there any way to cut down? What sources are you using? And one of the big things that I've been doing over the last few years is, trying to shift people from using, hi, babe, I'm on a call. Okay. Um, so uh, shifting from using marijuana to CBD um, tinctures and the oils and the, one of those options, because it doesn't seem to be as common if you don't have the combined THC CBD. So maybe that's why we don't see as much is that we shift that a little bit. So we don't necessarily tell them they can't use anything, but we do try to get them away from just the plain old marijuana mix. The other thing is that there's clear data on, hold on baby, um, that 
Mama? Smoking marijuana has adverse effects with anesthesia that really do match smoking. They have increased incidence of bronchitis, pneumonia, reintubation if they're smoking anything. So we tell all of them, if you're going to use, there's no smoking. And you, we try to have smoking cessation the same time we do any kind of nicotine cessation. So um, I think the type of marijuana people are using, the approach, and then tailoring it to get them off of the mixed product and onto the CBD better is better. <laughs> and now I'm going to mute myself for one second to see what this little man needs, but then I'll answer. I, I saw some other questions in the chat, so I'm happy to answer them. Yeah. And, and I think, um, uh, Ann Connor, Ann O'Connor, uh, just put in the question and answer a couple comments, um, saying as a pediatric surgeon, who does bariatric surgery, I wonder whether smoking vaping is worse than chewables, which, you know, is exactly what you were just saying. Um, and then she also commented on, you know, using things like cessation of marijuana as a marker of commitment to a healthier lifestyle, which I think is really interesting because we all do it, but I'm not sure that that is evidence-based. <laughs> um, so I don't know if you have any comments on that kind of thought process for, you know, how all this came about as marijuana is bad. Everybody has to quit. It's, you know, without having any proof that it's actually bad. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's hard because a lot of us have this kind of an ethical gauge somewhere that tells us that marijuana use is bad overall. And so we need to do it um, for a healthier lifestyle. But then I'll talk to the highly functional. And I always wonder if we pass some judgment because when I talk to the highly functional Intel executive who uses marijuana every day, most people would say they're highly functioning, making more money than any of us likely and doing quite well. But when I talk to the person that's maybe, you know, struggling, different socioeconomic group, et cetera, then we tend to tell them, well, you need to quit that to have a healthier lifestyle. And so it's pretty hard for me to determine how, where to make that uh, a healthy lifestyle cut off. And, and I saw that Josh Pfeiffer asked about our behavioral health colleagues and how they tied yes. into this. And they were really tied into it. We had to have some buy-off from them and that, are we willing to look at this and really delve deep into the use and the, any PTSD they have and other trauma they have. And so there was a lot of counseling around some of these patients about untreated mental health disorders, mm -hmm. um, how they were using the medications. Was there a way that we could get them to tie into therapists instead, if it was something that was related to trauma? Mm -hmm. So it's not a one-stop shop for sure. And I guess it just continues to say, we have to keep looking at our patients and treating them um, on an individual basis. And I look forward to people studying it more. I know there was a behavioral health study on marijuana use in bariatrics. And it talked a lot about that, of them medicating potentially because they weren't getting treatments. And I think that's just unfortunate. We really, if we could find a way to give them more longstanding mental health support, that that would be obviously the most favorable. Well, and I think at least from my experience, um, cause we only have medicinal marijuana in Oklahoma, which for what it's worth, <laughs> I'm not sure how medicinal it is, uh, for real. Um, but a lot of our patients use it as a substitute for narcotics after orthopedic, orthopedic injuries, um, or surgeries, um, or severe like osteoarthritis or cancer treatments, you know, cause a lot of patients who go through cancer treatment gain weight from the chemotherapy and the steroids. And so I think the, the kind of the thing that you guys, one of the things that you didn't look at was the reason that people were using marijuana. And I think that that's really, really fascinating and might help kind of tease out the few outliers for which it does cause problems versus the majority of people for which it probably doesn't. Yeah, I totally agree. I think if we knew motivation and I would really love to know how people are using it in doses too. So we could correlate that a little bit because I, I suspect the folks, uh, and I've seen the case reports published of the patient that gets a terrible ulcer and the only risk factor they have is that they're smoking marijuana. Um, physiologically, can that happen? Well, I, I can't imagine that I can't say no, because we know it does cause tachycardia. 
So if nicotine causes some relative tissue ischemia, why would smoking pot not do something similar, especially if you're doing a lot of it? Um, so being able to quantify how much people are using and how they're using it would be very helpful for our outcomes overall, because right now we're lumping everyone together from the person that takes an edible once every month to someone that uses it every day, multiple times a day. And so, yeah, there's a lot to be desired uh, in this area. Um, I think I saw from Dr. Toder, she was asking something about being on the honor system now, since we can't tell how they're using it. And yeah, I guess it is. Um, and I think telehealth has told us, taught us a lot about the honor system in my mind, because we've now, I don't know about everyone else, but I know our program still uses a lot of telehealth for patients. So I, I use the honor system for them to tell me how much they weigh and a lot of other variables. And so I, I think when patients know that it's not punitive, that you're asking for their medical information and you're giving them some information back about it, that they tend to be open. And I did notice a difference in reporting the very first year it was legalized in Colorado. <laughs> there were people that told me later, hey, I didn't want to tell you the truth. I thought you were going to tell me I could never have surgery if I told you that. Um, but over five years then in Oregon, it, I, part of the reason, again, probably that we got increased usage is maybe the same group that have been using all along, but now they're much more open to telling us. And we did have maybe some more conversations that were saying options. What can we do? Is there a way we can cut down? Um, can you use a CBD only product? Is that a reasonable thing to try? So it wasn't as scary of a conversation. Yeah. And just, um, to let everybody uh, know who's here, if you uh, want to ask a question, you can also raise your hand and we can bring you into the panelist panel here um, and you can join the discussion. So feel free. Um, and if you would like to just type your question and not talk in public, that is also cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, Michelle, if you wanna ask a question. Uh, yeah, um, so it was talking to Michelle Toto, I practice, I've been practicing for 20, like seven years up in uh, Northern Maine. And um, uh, we have just heavy marijuana use, um, heavy telehealth use also, which, you know, it's like one of the great things that's come out of the pandemic because we have a huge geographic region and we've been, we were ready to pivot to telehealth, but we couldn't bill for it. So that's been great for our patients. It does make the sort of the weights really problematic, but um, gosh, so we've, uh, we've asked people to switch to edibles or any other form besides smoking, because smoking is so problematic. Um, and we tend to have very heavy patients. So I have a 60 to 70% gastric bypass population. So just smoking, like you said, of any, anything, you know, we say tea leaves, talcum powder, I don't care what it is, don't smoke. Um, but we have no way of testing for that. And when I ask people why they are still smoking and they're having problems and coming in with ulcers and issues that um, all the other forms are more expensive. Um, so there's a socioeconomic barrier to, to making that transition. Um, so I, we, we started actually, it's our QI project for um, MBSA Equip this year is to do exactly what you've been doing, to look at our marijuana users and see whether we're seeing uh, any problems. And, um, I, I sort, and I'm not seeing problems either, um, but I'm uh, suspicious that we, you know, our one year QI project just isn't enough. So I'm hoping to continue to follow these people separate from MBSA Equip QI project because I, I really worry um, about the hyperemesis because we do see that. And I really worry about the smoking in my bypass patients. And we just have no way of getting an honest answer because they're, they're going to test positive whether they're using edibles or uh, smoking. It's frustrating. It's Is it legal in Maine? Oh, yeah. Um, and how long has it been legal there? Oh, years. We're like right behind Colorado, I believe. I just think it's so interesting because, you know, in Oklahoma, it's only been medicinal and it's only been about two years. So we're like super early on the curve and people can only get um, edibles here. They're, they do not allow um, the med medicinal places to sell this, you know, whatever the version that you smoke. Uh, I just made myself sound really dumb there and not cool. Um <laughs> But um, <laughs> I think it might be interesting to kind of track these things over time and see like the states where it became legal really early, is it fine in the beginning, but then when it becomes really endemic and extensive and moves into different versions, maybe it, it is a problem. 
Hey, it's Kenor. Hi, hi, Farah. Um, so we had the pleasure, Dr. Hussein and I, of debating one another at ASMBS on this topic because I am still in a state where there is no medicinal marijuana. We have nothing, and so it's completely unregulated. And I think for that reason, I'm still really recalcitrant um, to operating on those patients just because it's so uncontrolled. It's just a wild card variable. Um, and I just wanted to let you know that after our lecture, our AV guy came up to me because he heard us talking about it. And so one of the issues, right, is that people are smoking it or they're eating gummies. And we said, neither of those is great. It's either a sugar load or they're smoking something. And he said, hey, I just wanted you to know there's a show called Bong Appetit. FYI. So for everybody listening, there's a show, I looked it up, it's real. It's people cooking with marijuana, like using it in food. So That's decreasing hilarious. the sugar content, <laughs> decreasing the actual grams of sugar in their, in their diet, but using marijuana all the same. So I just wanted to put that out there and say, you know, I think this is a really important topic for me. It's still just the, the lack of, of dosage information, the lack of any sort of control over this that makes me still pretty unready to, to be able to let these patients kind of continue. But at the same time, I have to consider, and you know, I think I learned a lot from Farah about this, that it's really, are they, are they not coping or are they using it as a medication? I think that really is the most important thing to consider when it comes to your patient's health and their marijuana use. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is that we should start working on a marijuana low sugar cookbook <laughs> to present to the executive council of, of the SMBS. I think this should probably <laughs> You'll have be my spearheaded by somebody where it's legal. Linda and edibles, and it'll solve your chronic pain issues too. Uh, I have to say, I'm actually on the same side as you, uh, Kanur. I, um, marijuana is not legal in Texas and I see a fair bit of patients that come in and just, I am also a little resistant to operating on them because I don't know exactly how much they're taking in. Um, I think it's great. I was very happy to read this. I'm, I'm glad that we chose this, um, paper for a discussion today. Um, but I still just have a lot of hesitation with telling patients, you know, like, okay, I know you're doing something that technically is illegal in our state. And, you know, we don't, we don't know exactly how much you're doing, how much you're using. Um, but you know, and they don't know, right. Time. They don't know yeah. what it's cut with. They don't know how it's made. They don't know where it's coming from. So I'm not sure that it's exactly, I mean, I'm not being judgmental at all. I just yeah. want my patients to be safe. But yeah. at the same time, um, you know, when my patients have um, like non-responsive nausea and vomiting, I do prescribe uh, uh, yeah. dronabinol for them. Marinol, yeah. Yeah, Marinol. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and that's the THC version of it. So, you know, I don't know if maybe the CBD version might be a little bit better for them. I yeah, think the, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no problem, Laura. I was just going to say, I think in some ways being in the illegal states right now is actually the easier place to be because a lot of the insurances too, right? That I think that drove us for a while. And when I was in my last duty station in the army, I was in Georgia and it was illegal and um, insurers wouldn't cover the surgery with a positive drug test. So that also, I mean, it was very cut and dry, illegal substance talks negative to get to surgery. And it got much more gray for me when I got to a place where they didn't have that rule. And then the assurances also took that off of their requirement because then it became much more of a judgment call. So um, I would say the biggest struggle probably right now is in places where it's legal, either medicinally or recreationally, because you do have to decide what your cutoffs are going to be. And is that something that's going to be a hard call, but I have this like pipe dream of being able to do an RCT with CBD versus placebo. <laughs> I don't, I don't, every time I mention to one of my pharmacists, they almost have a heart attack and like leave the room quickly. But I think it's really intriguing because CBD we've seen in a couple of studies that it's a good anti-inflammatory, but it works differently from NSAIDs. And so if it was a really good anti-inflammatory, we could safely give to our patients medicinally then we could take control of how much they were using and actually follow those outcomes a little bit 
longer. So I guess if anyone has a connection in the CBD industry, I too am very square. I know nobody. So uh, <laughs> no, it's just something I, I've thought about a lot is that there might be a part of that that we could actually harness some benefit from because yeah, we use Marinol for different indications that could help our population. Um, but how can we find out that that specific element is safe? And if it is, then could we prescribe it to people? Because I've had folks like Laura said too, that have not taken a single opioid and used maybe like one thing of CBD each night and they say they don't have much pain. And so it, again, maybe one more thing that we could add to multimodal treatment, but I'd be intrigued. I think it's really fascinating, um, Kanur and Julianne. I did not know that you guys were in illegal state still. I feel like, I don't know, I feel like living in Oklahoma, maybe I'm just always the last one to have ever, anything. Um, but I was exactly in your position like it, two years ago, where where if somebody came in and they used marijuana, we were all like, uh-uh, no, you know, must quit, negative, your, you know, urine screens, all this stuff. And when it became medicinal, we started getting the question, and I actually am friends with the first author as well, uh, Dr. Warrist, who is a general surgeon in Montana now. Um, and she told me about this paper before it was published um, and was like, yeah, we didn't see any difference. It was fine. And I was kind of like, what? Oh. And as soon as we decided to just stop worrying about it and just not have it be a thing, like everyone in my whole clinic, we just totally changed our minds. And now it's completely fine. Um, which I, I think is just really interesting how you can be so set in a certain way and then one thing happens and you can just divert to a totally different path with new, with different data, a different, you know, like having it be illegal versus legal, I think just changes the whole idea of it as a drug versus a medicine. Um, I think it's really fascinating. I don't know. Yeah. And I would say I'm not. I don't say no to everybody. I say, if you're, if you're using every day, then to me, that is an indication that we need to delve deeper into the reasons that you are using every day. Um, I think for people who use like, you know, socially once every now and then I don't test them. I don't, it doesn't, it's, it's, you know, people drink alcohol, people smoke pot every now and then, as long as it's a, a reasonable amount of use. And it's not something that I feel is going to affect their post-operative recovery or success. But at the same time, I do tell them, this is something that's not legal. You probably shouldn't do it just because it's not legal. Yeah. And I'm not testing either. I just, um, it, it does make, it gives me pause personally. Um, and I do encourage patients whenever um, I meet them to stop um, to stop using it before or around the time of surgery. Um, but I, you know, one of the things that was brought up in the Q and a by Ann O'Connor is something that is a concern for me as well, because if they are using marijuana, is there some other illicit drug use that's also happening? I do think about that. And I think that's a part of my concern, um, with these patients. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, again, there's literature that shows marijuana can be a gateway drug. <clears throat> and so if you have concerns, if they're over treating mental health issues with it, et cetera, like Dr. Uh, James Mingler said, if they're using it all the time to get away from something, we have to delve deeper in that with adolescents, if Dr. O'Connor is working with heavily, um, I probably would have a much shorter stick with that because I think that's a, a very different population. And I guess all the parents in us come out or we're saying, uh, a 12 to 17 year old, maybe don't ask why a 17 versus 18 year old has more brain power to make that decision, but that's the cutoff we have. I, I tend to hesitate a lot more on them. I want them to go through much more of the counseling therapy side and see if we can go through cessation in that population, because I think they are probably higher risk for having it as a gateway drug when they're young and potentially are in that substance use disorder risk already. Um, and that maybe that's not correct in my mind or, you know, actual bipedes literature, but I think they have a lot of years there where they're already going to be at higher risk for substance use disorder. And if they're already using a gateway drug in their adolescent years, where does that leave them? So, um, Josh Pfeiffer in the chat, um, 
posted a question about um, being surprised that tobacco use was lower in the marijuana group, which I was also surprised about because at least in my like college friend experience, the people who smoked pot also were smokers, like cigarette smokers. Um, any thoughts on that finding and kind of this concept of marijuana being a gateway drug, um, Dr. Hussein? I tend to, to think that they tend to swap, maybe swap addictions to some extent, because I think in both of our studies, what we did see is there were a higher number of history of smoking in our marijuana use groups. So it made me wonder, were they smokers initially? And then they went to marijuana. Uh, and does cost factor in at that point where doing both actually does cost quite a bit more. And so you get a different effect from one versus the other. Um, so yeah, I don't know, is, is one more of a gateway than the other? So is nicotine the first door that opened the thoughts of then going to marijuana next is a question. I'd be curious too, like how much detail you got on their smoking um, information because people who smoke marijuana will often mix it with tobacco, but may not consider that smoking, like smoking cigarettes, but it's still nicotine. And then we've also had some people who, you know, we don't, we don't make people stop smoking marijuana, but we do have a zero nicotine policy. So they'll say, oh, well, I'm using marijuana medicinally, but they keep testing positive for nicotine. And we found some people have been using their rolling papers actually have nicotine impregnated in the rolling paper. So we've had them actually have to change their rolling papers to be able to test nicotine negative. Um, so I don't know. I, I don't, maybe that's like super detailed and I don't know how much detail you had on their actual smoking and what was it and, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. I think like many programs, we tend to test everyone for nicotine, <clears throat> especially if they have any history of smoking, but um, many people at entry initially, we were even testing just for nicotine positivity with us, just a serum coatening test. And when vaping first got very popular, I don't even remember when that was, we were having a lot of people having a surprise positive. And they swore, like, I've never smoked in my life. I've never used nicotine. And here, when they bring their cartridges into us, we would read the fine print. And sure enough, it would say, you know, nicotine's one of the trace products in there. So it is, again, we're working with a very unregulated product here, completely unregulated, actually. Uh, and if I think about my high school friends who are now running their dispensaries, they're not maybe the most reliable people I would trust to dispense my drugs my medicinal drugs. But with that being said, that was totally, Your that was totally judgment. <laughs> yeah. That was really nice. But um, with that being said, I think there's a loss, a lot of cross-contamination. Mm -hmm. And so they, it again, begs to being very careful with it. And it's again, one of those reasons why I'd really love to see us be able to somehow study just a component of the marijuana makeup and see what does each component do, because then maybe we could control it a little more and say, this is good this is bad. Here's where you get it from. And again, if we prescribe it to them, then they have it. But right now they're, they're smoking tar, nicotine, marijuana, all mixed in one. So mm -hmm. it is very hard to tell. Um, I'd love to see if anybody um, in the audience has a question, please feel free to um, join in and ask or put your comment in the chat. Um, I did want to ask, uh, Dr. Smith, um, you've been very quiet. <laughs> um, number one, do you have any questions? Number two, I have a question for you. And that is, um, you are going to be a bariatric surgeon in just a few short months when you graduate, what is going to be your marijuana use policy for your patients? Um, that's a great question. Um, Probably I'd want to delve into the reason for their marijuana use as well as the frequency, which is what you guys have all been talking about, really. Um, if it's again, if it's somebody who occasionally uses it, you know, once a month, not a, as big of a deal. Um, but it, if it's somebody who's using it for an underlying, um, you know, coping mechanism for lifestyle hardships, um, you know, that's something I would want to address before I offer them surgery. More importantly, um, a lot of the bariatric surgery is 
um, in our programs is much more than just the operation itself, as, as you all know. Um, it's about you know lifestyle changes um, and just offering a and developing a healthier life. Um, and marijuana use, um, especially frequent marijuana use, is part of an unhealthy life. So uh, I'd want to work with you know psychological colleagues, uh, et cetera, you know, to get that under control before subjecting patients, you know, to an operation that they might not be able to handle. Um, I did want to say uh, for, to Dr. Hussein um, that I really did appreciate this article because, um, you know, there's not a whole lot out there about this topic. And so when you're doing like a, a, trail, a trailblazing article, you open the door for a lot of future studies. Um, and I think that is what this paper has really done um, most for me is not necessarily given a definitive answer on is marijuana use a contraindication to bariatric surgery, yes or no, but more a springboard for future studies to delve into that question. Thank you, Brenda. That was very nice. Yeah. And good luck in your career. Thank you. And I, I think for the fellows, I mean, <clears throat> one of the things, you know, at least in my residency, everybody always said that you should you should not, you shouldn't do all your training in one place, right? You should experience other institutions, other ways of doing things. And I remember when I went to fellowship, there were some things that I thought were like ironclad law. And when I moved from Wisconsin to Oregon, they just did it completely opposite and everyone acted like it was normal. And I was like, what is happening? One example is um, in Wisconsin, we always did 5,000 units of heparin before intubation. And in Oregon, we did our bariatric Lovenac shots in the PACU. And I was like, this is malpractice, you know, how can you do that? And, and it, when you go somewhere else and see how other people do it, you realize that a lot of the stuff we learn is not actually data-driven, it's convention. You know, and just because you learn something a certain way doesn't mean that it's necessarily the correct way or that it's necessary. So like Dr. Hussein's experience of learning that marijuana use was an absolute contraindication and then being able to say like, oh, maybe that's not 100% true, I think is a really important point for all of us to always be questioning what we do and think about is what I'm doing the best thing for the patient? Is it grounded in serious data? Um, are there other things that we need to study? Because, you know, that's how we move our field forward and, and make, you know, what we do more effective and safer and better for our patients. So, so thanks, Farah. Thank you, Laura. And I just honestly, what a throw. I, I totally um, agree with what you're saying is that when we stop asking questions, then, then we'll probably need to th rethink what we're doing. Um, but I'm really inspired by the things you guys are doing with this bariatric surgery training group. Uh, I think of you, Kenor, Julianne, Adrian as just amazing groundbreakers in this world. And so thank you for making this a platform where we can even talk about these things. And I love it. So great work. All right, you guys. Well, I am going to close up shop if I don't have any more questions. Um, but um, Dr. Smith, thank you. That was a fantastic presentation. Really clear, um, straightforward, hit all the salient points. Um, so I appreciate you. And then Dr. Hussein, thank you so much for joining us. It has been absolutely a treat. Uh, and I apologize for my dogs. Um, but I hope everybody has a really wonderful night and I look forward to seeing you all at our next bariatric happy hour in November. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Good night. Thank you guys.